llama antibodies, Neolithic beer, Neanderthals, and a music video. Hello fellow humans and welcome to the Milk of Hot Moon Lab. I'm calling this video Potluck Sunday because I'm going to touch on a few subjects just briefly. I haven't done a video in a while for various reasons. The internet was out at the place where I was living under quarantine. I was able to move, which wasn't easy, but I got a little apartment where the internet seems to be stronger and the electricity is a little bit more stable. The application I was using for my background and my images has been giving me fits lately. So this morning is just bare bones. I got my iced coffee because it's always hot here in, in the rainforest of Peru, even though it's 4.30 in the morning. And they do have very good coffee. And I'm going to touch briefly on a few subjects. So let's start with the llama antibodies. About four years ago, researchers had worked with a, a llama named Winter. And technically, it's a double L, the word llama, so it should be yama, but I'm just going to pronounce it llama. It's easier for me. And they found that antibodies from this llama, Winter, were able to neutralize both the SARS and the MERS viruses. Now, SARS and MERS are close, closely related to COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 is actually SARS-CoV-2, but they call it COVID-19 because it popped up in December of last year, 2019. So, lo and behold, these antibodies from llama actually neutralize the COVID-19 virus. Now, this is cool because this is a treatment. It's not a vaccine. A vaccine, as we know from getting the flu shot, you need to take it before you get sick. You take it before you get sick, and it builds up your body's defenses against whatever sickness, virus, whatever you're treating. This is a treatment, a medicine. So you can take it while you're sick. You can also take it before you get sick as a preventative. And the thing that they're finding is these antibodies from llamas, the, the shape of them, allow themselves to attach to different coronaviruses and then neutralize the virus. So this is a really exciting finding. But don't get too excited. Remember, we need to be patient. This is not going to happen tomorrow. This is going to be about a year. They need to do more studies, uh, human trials. Uh, they need to then start manufacturing the drug and get it disseminated. So this is going to be about a year, just like the vaccine. You know, this is the thing, people. In, in a year, year and a half, we're going to have a vaccine and we're going to have medicine. Okay, so things are going to get better. I'm an optimist. I'm a realist, but I'm also an optimist. So kind of an exciting new finding um, about corona, coronavirus, COVID-19. And wonderful llamas. They're actually kind of vile creatures. You can see, <laughs> you can see um, like pictures and videos of the women in the Andes uh, at the market and stuff like that with baby llamas, like in baby slings, and they're really cute and adorable. But once they get older and big, they're kind of obnoxious. But anyway, okay, so that's llamas. Llamas and COVID 19, a good, exciting new study. Now let's talk about Neanderthals. Neanderthals are one of my favorite subjects because I carry quite a few on the spectrum of, of um, having Neanderthal genes. I have about three and a half percent. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about two, two recent findings. One of them is another genetic study done by the Max Planck Institute and um, Svante Pablo's um, research team. And I hope I'm saying his name right. His team was the one that first mapped the Neanderthal genome. They were the ones who first were able to extract viable DNA from Neanderthal bones and map the genome. What they have found is that there is a receptor for progesterone, I hope I'm saying that right, which is a hormone. And a third of women in Europe carry this, this receptor gene inherited from Neanderthals. Now, what this um, hormone does is it, during pregnancy, it decreases bleeding, uh, it increases fertility, 
and there's something else. I'm gonna pull up the paper to look at the paper. Um, and and they people have fewer miscarriages. I knew there was one other thing that I was looking for. So therefore, it, it, it provides um, increased fertility. So uh, this um, inherited gene variant, um, it's found at 10 times more often than most other Neanderthal gene variants. And this suggests that this, this variant, yeah, is very um, uh, beneficial to people and increase, is very adaptive, they like to say. And it has a, quite a favorable effect on fertility. So this is just another thing that Neanderthals have, have given us. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and go to archaeology and um, research done by UC Davis, Department of Anthropology, um, the author Naomi Martisius. I hope I'm saying that right, Naomi. And what she did, she looked at bones at a Neanderthal site and there's a tool called I hope I'm saying this right, Lesor, which is used to work hides and make them into leather, um, things like buckskin. And she looked at bones at this site, and what she found was that there were several ungulates, um, bones from ungulates, and she was looking at rib bones. And the main food was reindeer, bison, oryx. Now, but the tools were only being made from the oryx and the bison because there's a thicker, stronger, harder bone. And this suggests that um, this, this group had been using these bones for a long period of time. It was a long tradition because they had special materials that they preferred to use for this particular job. That suggests that the tradition had been around long enough for people to develop um, uh, specific likings of materials that they liked. Um, it also suggests that the clothing that Neanderthals had were perhaps better than, definitely better than the pictures and the images we're so used to seeing, but better than we thought before also, um, because these bone tools could be used to make buckskin. And what you do is you use some sort of acid, um, uric acid, tannic acid from brains. Usually that's what um, traditionally people would use is the brains from the animal to tan the hide and because the acid breaks down the fibers and then you use a some kind of tool to to work the hide and that's what makes it soft if you've ever felt buckskin clothing um, i've had the opportunity to wear buckskin clothing and it's so soft and comfortable um, that that that's how they did it so another thing there was this obviously a very advanced tradition of using specialized tools to to make um, buckskin leather clothing at this Neanderthal site. So again, we're finding more and more things about Neanderthals that they were quite a bit more advanced and not as different from us as we used to like to think. All right, so now let's move on to beer, Neolithic beer. Now, I think fermenting goes way, way back. Uh, lots of researchers and people like to think that it started with the, with the advent of agriculture. I think it went way back, the hunter-gatherers, and maybe even Homo erectus and Homo habilis, because this is why you think about it. You have made a bag from the stomach of an animal, okay? And you've collected a bunch of berries or some other fruit from, from around your, your, the area where you're staying. And over time, this fruit will begin to ferment. That's what fruit does when it goes bad. It starts to ferment. And you it has juice in the bottom of it or something, and you drink it because you're hungry and you're thirsty. And wow, you get this pleasant um, um, effect from it, and you kind of like it. So you start doing it more and more. Now, you don't need necessarily sprouted grains and things like that to do it. You can do it from seeds that you have stored. People could have done it from seeds they had stored, fruit, honey. So I think fermenting goes way, way back. Okay, so these archaeologists, and I'm going to pull up the paper here, have found a marker 
where you can determine whether or not malted, sprouted malted grains were used in pottery vessels. Um, there's a, a layer in the grain called the alurome um, that during the malting process it stays behind and changes the a thin layer of the pottery vessel. And they did a project where they determined that it works, that if you find this, you can look for something in the layer of the vessel and you can determine whether or not it had malted sprouted grains in the, ve in the vessel. So it's a marker to determine whether or not people were malting grains at particular sites. Um, so it's really kind of cool. So it provides a, a hard archaeological marker data to ethnographic historical records. Um, so they looked at vessels from three different sites and they use different kinds of spectrometry. It's really advanced now, but I'll put links in the article if you're really interested, you can look it up. You know, another benefit about why brewing and fermenting really, really took off was because you think about a lot of these settlements were lakeshore settlements. There was riverside settlements, lakeshore settlements. And the water's going to have parasites. And when you ferment and make, make beer and other kinds of things like chicha, which is a fermented corn, you're going to boil it. And so you're killing the parasites. And then with the alcohol content in it, it doesn't go bad as quickly. Water will go bad. If you just put river water or something in, in a jar or even tap water, it will go bad in a period of time. And so when you brew, when you ferment, this now your 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 beverage doesn't go bad. It stays good for a longer period of time. You also, when you sprout the grains, you're getting vitamins. Now they didn't know that at the time, but you're getting vitamins that you don't normally get from just eating the grain. Um, so there's quite a few benefits to fermenting and brewing other than just having a, a pleasant euphoric effect. So good. All right. Now I'm going to change gears again. Some of my most popular videos have been the videos I've done about music videos and songs. And what's going on here? I'm sorry. <laughs> a box pop up in my video and I'm not going to edit it. I'm just going to leave it in. So you, you see what this is. You know, hey, I'm not a professional video maker. But um, some of my um, videos about songs and music videos and I did one before um, by the group called Halen and I hope I say that right, which means Helen in, in Germanic, Proto-Germanic. And they have a, a video out called Norupo. And this is a there's also a video by Vlad Runa that is based on the Norwegian rune poem. And this song is also based on the Norwegian rune poem. Now the runes were um, symbols that, according to tradition, were brought into the world by Odin, who hung himself on the world tree Yggdrasil and for, to obtain higher knowledge. And he learned about the runes and he brought the runes to both the gods and the humans. Now the runes are come from an oral tradition. Um, they have been inscribed into stones and jewelry and things like that. But they really come from a very old, old oral tradition. And there isn't really like a text about what the runes mean. So it's really up to the individual who wants to learn about the runes. You need to contemplate and meditate and think about them. Um, it's a very meditative, contemplative practice to learn about the runes. And that's what Odin did. So anyway, this is based on the, the song by Halen is based on the Norwegian rune poem. Now the Norwegian rune poem comes from a written text that the original was by a person named Ove Vorm. And Jackson Crawford, who's a Norwegian scholar, um, states that he thinks this version of the Norwegian rune poem was dated to around 1000 AD, right around the time of Christian contact. 
the purpose of these rune poems, and there's a few different ones, are, is to help people remember the runes and their meanings. Um, the runes are words, and in poems they're used in sentences and alliterations. Um, so it's to repeat the runes and to help learn them and learn their meanings. So another interesting thing about this video is it's filmed, the official music video, is filmed at a Neolithic standing stone site. And let's see if I can get this name right. Pierre Drote. I hope it's a French word. I hope I'm getting that right. So it's a Neolithic standing stone site. Now these standing stone sites are ubiquitous in Europe, um, in Great Britain, um, in France, and, and other places where these were ritualistic sites um, where people would gather and have rituals. Now this site has over 400 stones. Um, they're organized in rows um, with a east-to-west orientation. Um, Archaeologists have dated it to about 6,500 years ago when it was first um, really constructed and being used. Now, it was used over and over again over thousands of years um, with these sites. That's what would take place is generations and generations and generations over thousands of years would return to these sites and use them for rituals. Now, when Christian contact happened, the visiting the site was prohibited. They tried to destroy a lot of it, so it fell into disuse and disrepair. But now there's a museum there. I think it's like a, a protected historical site and things like that. So they filmed the, their official music video there. So I'll put a link to the music video below also, and you can look at that. And then the, the words to the songs are in the, I think, Proto-Germanic, um, Scandinavian blend of the Norwegian rune poem. My, I'm not a linguist in Scandinavian or Proto-Germanic languages, so I really don't know that much about it. I'm, I'm a trained anthropologist and archaeologist and psychologist, so that's more of where I'm coming from with that. So those were the videos I wanted to, the articles and the video I wanted to talk about. Now, the reason, the purpose of this channel really is to just touch briefly on various subjects in science, culture, uh, social issues, and I always provide links in the description below. So if you're interested, you can go to the articles, you can read them, you can do your own research. Now, with the quarantine and COVID-19, being a psychologist, I know for some people, they're not really that affected by quarantine. Uh, people with social anxiety, now they have a reason to stay home. And it's okay. Uh, oh no, I'll be home today. There's, there's no stress because you aren't attending social functions and things like that. So people with some kinds of social anxiety might actually be doing better. Also, people with various forms of obsessive compulsive disorder, they're probably sitting back saying, ah, see, I told you so. <laughs> you should be washing your hands and not touching people. But then for some people who really need that social connection, and think people like athletes who thrive on competition, uh, teachers who uh, need that environment in the classroom, it can be really hard. Um, one of the things I've been doing is there's various channels on YouTube that I really, really love for different kinds of topics in science, all kinds of topics. One of my favorites, maybe my favorite, is called Crash Course. And Crash Course is a YouTube channel that goes just briefly, but, but deeply and professionally, into various topics from theater, agriculture, European history, mythology, world religions, all kinds of subjects. And the videos are like 10 minutes long, but they're done very knowledgeably, they're very well prepared dues, lots of neat graphics and things like that. So Crash Course is one of my favorites. I talk about um, another channel, What the Math, often by a guy named Anton Petrov, is I think his name. And he mostly focuses on astrophysics, but he also goes into other science um, findings and even archaeology and things like that. And he puts out a video every day. But his videos are really good, so look at that. Um, PBS Eons is really good. 
there's a few of them. Um, Star Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson. And that's something you can do yeah, to keep your brain active, um, to learn new things. That's one of the best ways to fight depression and, and anxiety is to keep your brain active. Your brain loves novelty. Brains love novelty. So put on a video while you're, while you're cooking or you're eating dinner or something like that and try to learn something new. And I think that will help some of the people that have been struggling. Also, if you if you like to read, I know not many people read as much as, as we used to. Um, there's lots of sites that I go to, Science Direct, uh, Eureka, and then many of the magazines, um, American Anthropologist, Archaeology Today, places like that, where I visit every day just to look for new articles, especially Science Direct and Eureka. And maybe I'll put links to the description below in these, where they post they'll write a little bit about new research, new articles that have just come out like this week. And then they'll provide a link to the article. Now this is one of the things I, I rail about with, um, with the whole scholastic um, academic world is some of these articles are from publishers that you can't have access to unless you belong to it an institution, a university, and I really don't like that. But many of them you can access. So you can read the, the original research article and download it. So those are just some ideas to keep you from going crazy during this um, great pause and, and being in quarantine. Um, thank you for joining me. I hope this, this forum, just sitting here on my couch with my coffee was okay, and I hope the sound's a little bit better and things like that. Thank you for joining me. Stay sane, stay safe. And remember, fellow humans, to always stay gold.